Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus. Here's what we know. A Washington state resident fell ill after returning from Wuhan, China, where the outbreak began. Officials now say more than 400 people have been sickened and nine people have died. Today, the Dow plunging, losing more than a thousand points, its worst day in two years, wiping out this year's gains completely. Now, a short time ago, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak an international public health emergency. I have signed a stay-at-home order for the entire state of North Carolina. It's what we have to do to save lives. This order directs you to stay home unless you need to leave for essentials. Today, hundreds of people rallied in Raleigh, pushing for the governor to reopen churches across the state. Tonight, several conservative Christian leaders have filed a lawsuit against North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper, pushing for courts to throw out his rules restricting indoor religious services because of COVID-19. I miss in-person church services very much myself. This Sunday, I listened to my church service uh, online. And it's something that we've been having to do over the last few weeks in order to protect each other, in order to care about your neighbor. What we're hoping is that ministers and church leaders will put the health of their congregations at the head of their thinking here in consideration of each other, realizing that it is still dangerous to hold indoor services when people, more than 10 people are there and those people are closer together. And we wanna make sure that, that the people across this state are protected. My name is David Beatty, and I've been the pastor here at River Oak since our first service on March 21st, 1999. Our mission is to build followers of Jesus who are sent out to reach others, to reach out to others with his love and truth. And it's our belief that when Jesus made disciples, followers of his, he taught them to go into the world and serve and love and reach out to others. So that's our purpose. That's what we call our mission. We have taken a, uh, a more cautious, conservative approach. Uh, even though in North Carolina, churches could legally meet, we felt that might not necessarily be the best thing to do. So we were able to go online right away, begin a live stream service. Uh, the Department of Communications at High Point loaned us some equipment that really helped us initially with that. And uh, we found people like the, um, the live stream service at home. I'm afraid they like it a little too much because I think it's gonna be a while before some of them come back even after the COVID period passes. I'm Keith Sexton. I'm the pastor of Christ United Methodist Church in High Point, North Carolina. The United Methodist Church has a mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, we do that, and one of the ways that we do that is engaging our neighbors, particularly those who are food insecure. So the pantry, um, when we were able to do the community meal, and now the Thanksgiving event, are ways that our disciples engage people with the love of Jesus Christ. Initially, I reacted like many people a lot of hope that it would pass by the heat of summer, but it wasn't but a few weeks into it that I realized this was gonna be a long marathon and uh, did not realize how exhausting this would be. We couldn't worship in person and worship is really the, the connecting tissue of the church. It's what brings us all together and sends us all out into the world. So we began with um, Zoom worship and the learning curve there was interesting I'll say that. And John and team uh, started doing the work of getting our equipment together. And for a period of about seven, eight weeks, we collaborated with First Baptist, the people for whom we leased this space, um, in a joint worship. So it was interesting at the beginning of the pandemic 
two different brands of Christianity were operating together. And we probably, the only United Methodist Church who sold their property and living and operating in a Baptist church. Uh, but this is temporary space for us uh, as we discover what God has for us next. Uh, my name is John Jones and I'm a volunteer here at Christ United Methodist Church. The biggest challenge for me, first of all, was educating myself on how to do this stuff because uh, I was a sound guy, I was not a video production guy. Although I'm really familiar with computers and stuff like that, social media, internet stuff was just not something I spent a lot of time on. So when we talked about having to stream and upload and those kind of things, it was a uh, not a foreign concept, I was aware of it, but didn't do it myself. So I had to teach myself how to do it. The biggest barriers were the equipment. Um, we started with very basic stuff, uh, the things that First Baptist already had in place, which was just a single camera and, and they uh, uploaded to Facebook. And uh, we kind of did the same thing to start with. Um, gradually expanded uh, our capabilities, eventually got new equipment, additional equipment that allowed us to do a little more of a production as opposed to just a videotape and upload. The, the equipment was what really took the longest time to get uh, because everybody's trying to buy the same stuff. I just see it continuing uh, now that we've jumped into that field. It's, it's something the church has to do even if we go back to in-person uh, worship with the congregation here in the sanctuary, we'll still have to do the online because you know there are going to be people who that's the way they want to worship. Um, going back to an in-person service means that from up there we are basically managing two, two different services because we have the sound that we have to produce for the sanctuary and then we have the stream that we have to produce to go online. So yeah, it's, it's two, two separate things we have to manage. We have about 20-ish, 20 22, who are, have no internet whatsoever. And John has put together an FM transmitter system. So our goal is by Advent to have all the people who cannot uh, worship online to sit in the parking lot in their cars safely and at least hear the worship service. So that's, that's our next step. Keith had originally came to me and said, oh, we want to set up a sound system out in the parking lot so people can come into the parking lot and, you know, we can broadcast our service out there. And I just saw so many potential pitfalls there, weather being the thing. And I knew about these small, low power FM transmitters. Uh, so I proposed that, uh, had to do some research and educate myself again on that, but we purchased a, a low power FM transmitter. I haven't actually started using that yet because you know, I had to do some research into the actual FCC regulations concerning that because FM radio is licensed and uh, to the penalties can be pretty severe if you're running a pirate station. Um, so I had to find out, well, you know, how far can we transmit? Uh, so I had to do some research uh, on the transmitter as far as the power out, the radiated power. Now I have, I think, all the components that I need uh, where we'll actually set up, uh, set up the transmitter, put a signal into it, and have somebody drive down the road to see how far the signal goes. We uh, preferably don't want to broadcast beyond the parking lot. My name is Brett Canode and I am the Creative Communications Director here at River Oaks Community Church. My first reaction when I was told that we needed to transition into an online service was one of excitement. Um, broadcast is uh, what my background uh, is in before I went into ministry and so the idea that um, we were going to 
uh, find as many cameras as we could in that moment and, and hook them up and, and do all that we could to try to make uh, an online service happen in the matter of just a few days was something that, um, although a bit overwhelming, was exciting to me because that is, you know, what my background and expertise is. My feelings in getting everything ready was scrambled, anxious, uh, worried that I'm not going to be able to pull this off and wanting to, you know, in just a few days time. Um, and having access to just a couple of cameras, uh, it was one of uh, afraid that I wasn't gonna be able to execute it at all. Um, and on the congregation side, it was afraid that people wouldn't watch at all, that they just wouldn't be interested uh, in it and that they might not engage. Some of the things that have changed for my job being online is that I'm just doing much more live video production than I used to. So it used to be that the bulk of my uh, video production was all uh, you know, pre-produced, uh, packaged content versus now we're doing live uh, style content on Mondays, Wednesdays, and now two on Sundays. Um, then we do sort of an interview style segment between a pastor and another pastor as they kind of talk more in depth about the sermon. We do that on, on Mondays and although we're not live streaming it like there's a quick turnaround and then just posting that because there's just not enough time to do full post-production on it. And the same thing for the video piece that we do on Wednesday which is more of like a community get to know somebody type piece. So these were all things that we um, added and the frequency with which we're doing them and the amount of staff that we have, which is still just me, means that they have to be basically live produced. I actually have found that the non-technological, the low-tech things that we've done during this season have had the most impact on our congregation. Um, and for me, as someone who, you know, loves tech and loves production, uh, that was uh, something that maybe was unexpected. Um, so we well, like one of the things we've been doing is just calling people, you know, <laughs> which is a lost art. Call somebody on the phone, you know. Uh, a, a congregation uh, calling our, our congregates on the phone and just asking them how they're doing. How are you doing? You know, uh, versus a text or an email, which is normally how we would interact with them. We started doing phone calls. We're trying to do all we can to keep people connected. Our staff, for example, goes through and calls the whole membership and just asks how they are and, try, and prays with them on the phone. You give people a sense of uh, that their, their church cares about them, thinking about them. It's very difficult to achieve being virtual, you know, because you don't meet new people in our coffee bar. We did a weekly, I'd like to get to know you, interview with someone in the church so others could meet them online. But it's, it's really impossible to replace the in-person community. And um, even when you are there and you're wearing a mask and it's more difficult to, to recognize people and see their faces and see them when they're singing, it's challenging. I mean, frankly, it's the koinonia, the fellowship, the community that has suffered in this. Everything that we've done from a technology standpoint has been super important and it's been key for our Sunday worship services. But from a relational connection standpoint, it's been these lower tech things that have really resonated with people. Hi, my name is Nicholas Martin. I remember being sent home from work in March, and kind of being uh, shuffled through a, a conference room with a bunch of other guys, uh, nobody masking, nobody socially distancing at the time, being handed a laptop, uh, shown how to log in to work from home, and uh, with the expectation that I would do this for a few days or a few weeks, and then I uh, would return to work and it would be life as usual. So I don't even remember the last church service we attended because when we attended, we had no idea that it would be the last church service for more than eight months. 
Um, and, and so, yeah, I couldn't even tell you what happened if, if we took communion, uh, what the sermon was about. Uh, we didn't tell anybody bye. <laughs> we just, uh, we went to church like we normally do. Uh, we were overwhelmed chasing kids around, and that was probably our biggest focus once that service ended, was just trying to corral our kids and get out without, with, the, with the least amount of drama possible. First thing that crossed my mind was, this is fantastic. We get to have church, but we don't have to get the kids up early, uh, get them fed, get them dressed, uh, deal with all of the fighting and the crying, get them in a car, drive 40 minutes, get them out of a car, check them in, and try to make it to the service on time, because that rarely happens. I, I got up, I think I made waffles, and eggs and we we took it easy and we waited for church to start um, the second thing that I remember about the first Sunday was this feeling of there just being these churches all over the country who would normally be closed off and have their normal congregation maybe a few visitors who are now streaming out with no barriers all over the world and I was never more excited to share something on social media than to share a free church service. And just the thought of the Word of God being sent out all over the world in a way that it had never been done before and on a scale that it had never been done before uh, was really exciting to me. And it still is. I'm, I'm still really excited. And, and it's, it's saved on all of these platforms. And there's no telling uh, who's watching the services that have already taken place and are saved on the likes of YouTube and Facebook and, and other platforms. So we have not started attending church in person uh, since the restrictions were lifted on in person. First of all, it's much easier for us to do church at home uh, here as a family. Uh, we haven't felt like it has affected our ability to worship in a negative way. So we're just continuing to do that and continuing to do things safely. And I, and I feel like the people who are gathering in church, they need the fellowship, uh, they need the community aspect. They might be people who don't have as large of a family that they can gather with at home. And by us attending, we would potentially expose them to germs that would be unnecessary since we have the ability to worship here at home. We don't wanna risk the chance of infecting anyone. I, we do have our four-year-old daughter and our newborn are both in daycare. Our six-year-old is back to in-person learning in school and so there's just a lot of potential for us to mix with other families and if we don't have to mix with church families in addition to that I think it's the wise thing for us to do. A, a Bible verse that often comes to mind throughout this is when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and Satan asked him to cast himself down and surely his Father in heaven would send angels to rescue him. And Jesus simply replied, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. And so that's kind of the way I feel about operating within a church in a pandemic. Uh, we have the ability to worship at home. We don't have to tempt the Lord by uh, mixing unnecessarily and potentially infecting someone, potentially bringing grief to someone's family or potentially keeping someone from being able to attend their job for two weeks and get paid because they're sick. I am a deacon in the church, and I, I do have the privilege uh, occasionally to pray with someone uh, about a personal need after church, and it's, it's always someone that I don't, I don't know, uh, and I do miss the opportunity to do that. Uh, I miss the miss the opportunity to pray with people. So my name is David Holcomb and I am the discipleship pastor here at River Oaks Community Church. I'd say the initial challenge was, um, was probably across a variety um, of demographics, particularly age was enabling uh, our leaders who may not be that familiar with technology uh, to feel comfortable in hosting Zoom calls and having their regular weekly calls on Zoom. So there was a lot of instructional um, 
uh, moments and, and uh, meetings just around the technology itself. That was key. The second part was really convincing others as the pandemic continued to, to uh, sort of lengthen, convincing them that this wasn't going away. And we really do need to um, start thinking about programs or events that were months out and planning for those. So planning was, was an element that was a bit difficult and probably still is really. Small groups, um, a, a number of them are meeting via Zoom. Some want to meet in person and, and you know, where you get, where it gets complicated is if you have part of a group that wants to meet in person wearing a mask, the others want to just stay on Zoom. And it, it's just a little different. It doesn't feel quite the same in a group like that. That's true of various team meetings in the church. Um, but everybody's, you know, doing online meetings too. And uh, sometimes it works real well. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. If we look to the future and look beyond the pandemic and all is normal again, uh, I would hope that the groups that have been together and remain together online virtually and you know in limited different ways, uh, that they would actually be stronger, that they're actually missing the engagement so much. This is what keeping them going. I would hope that the that, that new members uh, would be brought in as evidenced by their attending live stream worship and coming into the congregation itself. While discipleship ministries hasn't necessarily grown with new membership uh, because of the pandemic, um, the overall worship and congregation, we see many new faces and online, many new folks that will say they watch. So th that population of I'm new to River Oaks and I came to River Oaks during COVID, um, would hopeful would also find their way to discipleship in the, in the months and years to come. I think that we'll continue live streaming services for quite some time and that even if we stop live streaming, we'll continue to produce a higher quality multi-camera version of our service to go online, even if it's after the fact. We're realizing that there are a lot of people who have schedules that don't allow them to necessarily come on a Sunday. They work weekends, they travel on weekends, they have other things going on. And in the past, we've kind of, you know, just put a one camera shot of the sermon up. And now I think we're realizing that we really can offer people a full worship service, even if they're not able to attend on Sunday morning. And so I think we'll continue to do that, even if it's not a live stream. I am concerned that long term there will be people who've gotten too comfortable just watching a service at home. We've given people an excuse to stay home <laughs> rather than coming to the church building. And the very nature of, of church, the very meaning of the word ecclesia as it's used in scripture is, 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 is to be gathered together, called out but also gathered together as God's people. and. Um, I think it's important that we do regather eventually, but I think for some people it's going to be a little tough. On the other hand, benefits are there are a lot of people joining online who didn't come in person. Um, it's a way to keep people engaged who are traveling and traveling with children, sports and things like that. About 9% of all congregations will close. Of those that close, many of them were just hanging on and surviving. Survival is not an option for the church. You're either thriving or you're dying. So for those who live through COVID, if they do the hard work of asking the question, how do we make disciples? How do we reach every generation and every group of people, especially those who've been pushed out of the church? And how do we deploy our resources of people, time, talent, and finances in a way that builds the kingdom rather than the congregation? You're gonna see an entirely different way of being church. It's gonna be more communal and it's gonna rely upon digital technology to get that community in places we've never been before. So that's the good. The bad part about it is, is that some Christians are always slow to the party. Um, they're gonna come kicking and screaming or they're going to refuse to be part of this process. And that's the bad part that, that's been a part of the church since the first time we, we met in someone's home um, right after Jesus uh, ascended in heaven. This isn't a, a double blind, single thing, COVID issue. For us, it's COVID. 
it's that we've sold our property, that we're living in temporary quarters, and let's just name the 800 pound gorilla in the room. The partisan divide in our nation is infecting the church. In fact, we're part of the problem. And so you put all those into the stew, and yes, we're gonna lose people because they're looking for a different flavor. Um, and that's okay. Um, there are 800 different flavors of church within driving distance of this space. Uh, the question is, is the flavor feeding the world or feeding you? And so that's really what's at stake. Um, can we turn this time to a time of seeing the table as a table for everyone? And what's important is that my neighbor get fed. And just like your grandmother and your mother did at Thanksgiving, everybody got fed before grandma sat down to the table. Remember that? That's what the church needs to be. A servant who serves everyone before we get fed. And it's in serving that we actually get fed. And that's the lesson we need to reclaim. Thank you.